Hey guys, the next gen Intel CPUs are launching just around the corner, and that means a flood of motherboards are coming. As always, there will be options for everyone and then some. And to be honest, many motherboards are essentially copies of each other. With this in mind, we have secured a bunch of Z790 motherboards from ASUS to go over some of the things you should consider before buying, so that you can have all the features that you need and leave out the ones you don't. Let's get into it. The first and probably the most important question is, do you intend to do some overclocking? If so, then stick with the Z series. If not, maybe hold on and wait until the H or the B series, which will be out a little later on. You would have some trade-offs in features, but also save a buck on the board. The next important thing is not to ignore 600 series motherboards, as they are compatible with both 12 and 13 gen Intel CPUs. All you need to do is update the BIOS and you should be good to go. This is where some of the motherboard features come in. Many higher end boards have BIOS flashback feature, where you can copy the latest BIOS to flash drive and using specific ports update the BIOS without having the CPU installed. For boards without this feature, you have to get compatible CPU, boot into BIOS and only then do the upgrade. Another quality of life feature is the button to clear CMOS. This is super useful when doing any kind of overclocking and tinkering. Sometimes the settings you apply are just not suitable and the machine crashes, or even worse, it gets stuck in a weird boot loop. Having a physical button for this is nice as you don't need to open up your case and locate the CMOS clear pins to short them. By the way, if you're enjoying this video, please consider subscribing for more tech videos like this. Let's now jump for more core functionality to consider, starting with expandability. Many of those Z790 boards have multiple PCIe expansion slots, but not all of them are connected directly to the CPU due to the lane limitations. They all support at least one x 16 Gen 5 expansion directly to the CPU while Hero boards actually have two x16 slots, but if one of them is populated, they would both run in x8 mode. The rest of the slots across these mobile boards connect to the chipset first. There's a similar situation with NVMe drives. While both 12 and 13 Gen CPUs support PC Gen 5 drives, there aren't any on the market just yet, so I wouldn't focus on that too much. With that being said, the higher-end Strix E has the onboard PCIe Gen 5 SSD support, and both last and current gen Hero boards can support PCIe Gen 5 drive with the included ROG Hyper M.2 card. We put together a quick summary covering PCIe expansions with generations and lane configurations, as well as NVMe compatibility, which should give you some indication. For example, Strix E can support up to 5 NVMe drives on a single board, as well as few PCIe devices, but this is where it gets confusing. When M.2 slot 1 is used, the main PCIe Gen 5 slot will only run with 8 lanes instead of 16. These are the things you should consider ahead of time when planning out a build with multiple drives or expansions. The next important consideration is connectivity, starting with networking. I'm pretty happy that for wired networking, the 2.5 gigabit networking is now the new norm. You will have it on all these boards. Most of them are using Intel chip, with exception of the budget-friendly Prime P, which uses Realtek chip. As to wireless, we have Wi-Fi 6E and Bluetooth 5.2 across all the boards. When it comes to USB connectivity, this is where we see a lot of differences, starting with the type of connection, speed, or even power capabilities. Have a look at this table. The information is broken down into front header connections as well as rear USBs. Do bear in mind that for front header connections, you'll need to ensure your case or even separate modules you install support what you're aiming for. On the Hero mobile board, you can have front panel USB 3.2 Gen 2 times 2 with 60 watt charging, but you must install an additional power cable to the motherboard, and probably an extra brain for yourself to understand what that USB name actually means. At the high end, we now see boards with multiple Thunderbolt 4 ports in Type-C connector, as well as multiple crazy confusing USB types that exist. But to quickly summarize, we have simple 2.0 ports which have 480 megabit speed, then we have 5 gigabit ports, 10 gigabit ports as well as 20 gigabit ports. The aforementioned Fundable 4 is actually running at 40 gigabit. Do look out for the connection types as well. While we are talking about the connections at the back, there are some differences between built-in sound chips as well as the connections, but generally speaking, I would probably recommend getting a separate unit for this anyway. The next category is cooling. These boards have plenty of fan headers for almost any user, especially since you can daisy chain the fans together. But should you want maximum amount of fans, both Strix boards have 8 fan headers. Personally, I have become a fan of custom water cooling. This is where Hero board shines as it features additional headers for water in and out as well as water flow meter. With fans, 
they will likely be RGB. And all of these boards provide plenty of headers. It is kind of funny, but the cheapest Prime board features the most of them, with three addressable Gen 2 headers as well as two standard RGB headers. The last category for consideration is what you get in the box and the special features. For example, on the cheaper Prime board, you don't have an integrated IO shield, rather it comes separate in a box. Also, cheaper boards seem to have less extras like SATA cables. The high-end board like Maximus Hero comes with the M.2 expansion board as well as a separate USB for drivers, which is a nice touch. With the high-end boards, you also have better VRM and much beefier cooling for it, which together with troubleshooting error codes and LEDs help with overclocking and finding that sweet spot for performance and efficiency. I also like that most of the boards include M.2 Q-Latch, making it easier to install drive without faffing around with the small screws. Similarly, they have PCIe slot Q release for easier graphics card removal. Things to remember, both 12 and 13 gen Intel CPUs still support DDR4 and DDR5. Do make sure to choose your motherboard accordingly. DDR5 has certainly gone down in price since last year, but it's still very expensive. For more budget conscious users, it may be best to go with the higher end DDR4 version for now. Asus boards have D4 at the end of their product name, indicating DDR4 support. To sum it all up, personally, I don't believe there is a single best motherboard out there. Rather, there are options suitable for specific use cases, and you have to plan accordingly to your requirements. While I'm personally against future-proofing, since it's likely that your equipment will be outdated by the time that future arrives, I do recommend thinking slightly ahead in terms of things you plan to install and what you need such as extra slots for storage or expandability. Other than that, I hope we shed some light on the options available. If you want to check out any of the items we covered in the video, the links are in the description below. Don't forget to smash that thumbs up and subscribe for more. We'll see you guys in the next one.